It rings out the time at the top of every hour across Niagara on the lake. The cenotaph in that town turns 100 years old this year. And our Lieutenant Governor, Elizabeth Dowdswell, will be visiting the town this weekend to celebrate the event. Here to talk about it, we have Gary Burroughs, a councillor in Niagara on the Lake. Welcome, Gary. Thank you very much. And historian Ron Dale. Welcome as well, Ron. Thank you. Gary, well, talk about the visit this weekend and the plans for that celebration first? Well, the whole thing started uh, way back in February when we, the committee, there is a, a cenotaph committee, which is a town committee made up of mostly uh, individuals from the Legion. And uh, we uh, got together and said, well, June 4th, it's 100 years. It looks terrific today as it must have looked 100 years ago, but let's make sure. So we're, we've had uh, uh, Willowbank uh, check it out. We haven't got the report yet, but uh, we're going to renovate. So there's going to be fundraising after the fact uh, to look after that. How did it come about that the Lieutenant Governor was able to come this weekend? Well. Uh, that's a long story as well. Uh, I, I believe that we uh, protocols, you start with the uh, governor general and uh, with the uh, um, jubilee this weekend as well. Um, sh she's busy and so we next one was lieutenant governor. And it's actually more appropriate because the one that opened it a uh, hundred years ago was, was the lieutenant governor. governor, yes. This is an exciting time. Ron, from your perspective, the historical significance of this cenotaph, a lot of people call it the clock tower, and we always have to correct them. It's the correct. cenotaph. Yeah. Well, it's actually the clock tower cenotaph. cenotaph. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's, it, it represents the sacrifice of those from uh, actually, the old town of Niagara on the Lake, who who um, uh, lost their lives in World War One and World War Two, but beyond that, it's become a symbol for I think uh, not only all veterans, men and women who have served Canada in wartime and peacetime in the military, but uh, all of those who have contributed to making Canada the great country that it is. So it's very symbolic beyond just commemorating the war dead. There are uh, ten names from World War I, for example, on it. And uh, from 1914 to 1918, the first death in the town of Niagara was in May 1915. Uh, a fellow named William Perry Curry, who signed up right at the beginning of World War I, was killed early in 1915. He was the first casualty, but there would be nine more before the war was done. And uh, that hit the town very hard. It was a small town, and to lose that many citizens in uh, just in a few short years uh, encouraged them to build the cenotaph. And, and it has become a symbol then for the sacrifice and the dedication, I suppose, for Canadians since. What did the cenotaph originally cost and where was the money, where did it come from? Well, the, the, uh, it, was, it was immediately after the war ended in 1918 that uh, a group started to um, petition the government to build some sort of memorial. It was actually George Rand of the G Rand, Estate, Rand Estate who uh, really pushed the idea of a fitting memorial to the war dead. And uh, very soon after, by 1920, a committee had formed and had decided on a clock tower. And the, the idea of a clock tower is that uh, not everyone could afford a watch back then. Right. So this was a community thing that would ring out the hours. Uh, it was linked, uh, the clock would be linked to the town hall bell that had been cast in 1837 in Massachusetts and uh, would ring the hours and people could tell the time from the town clock. And at, at that time the town hall was just across the road from that that's, location? That's exactly it. And um, so they, they costed out the, um, uh, the proposed clock tower at $8,000, which doesn't sound much in today's terms, but uh, that would have been several years salary for a workman back at that time. It was relatively inexpensive, but, uh, but not insignificant, the amount that needed to be raised. 
Um, that was really pushed by a fellow who had become the mayor of Niagara on the lake, Joe Muzzin. And uh, they were really pushing for that. However, Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Nellis, who was uh, in charge of Camp Niagara at the time and had lost a son in World War I, was uh, pushing for a, a different type of memorial. He right. wanted a hospital. He right. wanted to replace the Niagara Cottage Hospital with a new hospital for $10,000. Uh, others wanted a traditional, you know, bronze soldier on a pedestal throwing a hand grenade or something like that, you know, as, as many right. more memorials are. Uh, a sports park was uh, pushed and a high school, a new high school in Niagara-on-the-Lake was another proposal. So all of these proposals were argued and debated as only Niagara-on-the-Lakers can do. <laughs> and uh, finally they held a plebiscite in 1920, June 1920, and the local newspaper pointed out that the uh, more voters turned out for that plebiscite than would turn out in any other election. Right. I mean, it really <laughs> Just like today. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the winner was the clock tower. Then the debate was, well, where do we put it? And there were two possibilities. One was where it was where it ended up, and the other was in Simcoe Park. They were going to build it in Simcoe Park. And uh, it was swigging towards Simcoe Park, but returning soldiers who were arriving back from the war in, in 1919 and 1920 swung the vote. They thought it had to be put where it was most prominent, and that was the corner of King and Queen Street, and that's where it went. Uh, so that was in June 1920, the decision, the final decisions to build the clock tower on Queen Street. And uh, the money was raised through the sale of victory bonds. Victory right. bonds had been sold during World War I to help support the war effort. And the government permitted the town to use the victory bonds to fund the clock tower. Interestingly enough, it came in on budget and on time. <laughs> Unlike today. <laughs> so it was completed in, in uh, June 1922 and um, early in June as Gary was saying and then later in June uh, is when the finally, uh, final dedication was made with uh, the left-handed governor unveiling the, the new clock tower. And of course we need to spruce that up to make sure that it lasts for another 100 years. We're going to talk about that with Stan Harrington. We're yes. going to take a short break right now and Stan Harrington will join us in studio. He's from the Legion and he will talk about what needs to be done to get this cenotaph up to shape. We'll be right back in a moment. We are back. We're now looking at the fundraising aspect to restore the Niagara on the Lake Clock Tower Cenotaph to the condition it should be in. Stan Harrington joins us, past president of the Legion in Niagara on the Lake. Stan, what exactly needs to be done? Well, we, we have a, a report coming from uh, Willowbank School, and they have, so far they've indicated the, uh, the brick on the outside had to be pointed. Some of the cement has to be parred. It's, it's deteriorated over the last hundred years. The biggest problem we have is water damage inside, because if you look at the, the cenotaph itself, there is openings and the water does go in. We also have to uh, maybe upgrade our mechanism to bring in the bell. Uh, we've had uh, one gentleman that was there for quite a few years, 20 years, uh, Jim Smith, that actually did it and now we uh, looked after it. And he actually converted the operation from a car battery into an electric uh, system that we have today. And now that is uh, manned by another volunteer that does it for free. That has to be looked at as well. Um, 
The last time we did fundraising, we did uh, some, some uh, uh, the new flagpole interlocking brick for the side in both cenotaphs, one in Queens and the one in the old town. And so this time it's making sure that it lasts for another hundred years so that the generations of the future will enjoy as much as we all do. Do you have a cost yet for this? We don't have a final cost yet, just estimates, so we want, don't want to set a budget for it. We are receiving funds now and we have received donations. Um, but it probably will be substantial because the location of the, the center of being the center of town, uh, it's, it's hard to do renovations. So you need equipment to go in so, and it will block the street. Uh, but we're hoping that that will come within a month or so, then we can do our budgeting. When do you expect to launch the campaign? The, well, we've already launched it. Um, there's a, there's several ways you can do it. You can send a check either to, to the Royal Canadian Legion in uh, Niagara and Lake, General Nellis Branch, or the town of Niagara and Lake in um, Virgil. Or you can, uh, for uh, cash donations, we do have a jar at uh, Legion, like we did in the past, uh, you can put cash donations. Uh, there's also a system, if you go online, through the town website, you can actually donate uh, direct from your account or from uh, your credit card. And the town will give you anybody a receipt for anything over $25 if you get a tax receipt. When do you hope that this work takes place? Uh, the work we're hoping will be start maybe next spring. There's only certain times of the year we can do it because of uh, uh, the busyness of the street. And for example, in November we have Remembrance Day. Then in uh, we have Polish Sunday during the summer. So it can't be done during those days. Or 9/11 is also a ceremony there. So we that has work has to be worked around the dates. That's important. Makes and perfect sense. Stan, thank you for joining us and filling us in on the fundraising campaign. Well, you're quite welcome. Thank you very much for having us.